Fish and Wildlife Service, wildlife biologist. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, Endangered Species Act. Please welcome Steve Abel. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I am the alternative. I appreciate you guys sticking around. I appreciate the invitation. Um, uh, the service and I certainly am always uh, uh, pleased to have these opportunities to engage like this. Um, when Cub initially um, contacted me, I wasn't really sure what to present. Um, I'm not. I'm a. I'm a novice of the ESA. Truly, quite frankly, a novice student. I don't. I don't know it that well. I know my little piece. Um, so I'll see what I do. Um, I kind of broke it up into three pieces. A little bit of ESA general background 101 history. A little bit of the piece that I'm most familiar with, and I think the piece that folks in here are most inclined to uh, be interested in. I'll explain that a little bit, and then I'll finish with a little bit of section on um, grouse, how we got here, where we are, where we're going with regards to um, the Endangered Species Act. Of course, my, uh, I initially had my lettering in red, but you couldn't see that when I put it on the projector that was us goofing around. Um, tongue in cheek, no doubt. This was taken on my front porch last night with my kids. <laughs> I was trying to be all spooky. I was looking for lettering that had like dripping blood, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> but that being said, it is scary. It's a scary topic. I think everybody knows that hard decisions are scary. And the ESA is at the heart of a very hard decision. How do we balance conservation of species, not just for the species' sake, but for our own sake. We need it, humanity needs it, with the demands of humanity. That's an incredibly challenging question, and that's where we are, and it's a scary topic, no doubt about it. So the purpose of the ESA, this is um, right in the beginning. I should have brought my, actually I do have my copy. The ESA is a very small act, it's kind of amazing. 30, 40 pages, very readable, and completely different to what you see in these days. But so the purpose of the act is basically to conserve the ecosystems that species rely on and the species that are there. Very simple, very naive. An amazing thing to tackle. So as I was researching some of the history of the ESA, some of the factoids are fascinating. The ESA was passed December 28, 1973. Richard Nixon said this, Republican president, in 1972. That's, that's amazing. The House passed it 355 to 4. The Senate passes it with no dissent, up and down vote. They say everybody walks in the room just by voice. You don't even have to write it down. Those numbers are incredible to me in this day and age of partisanship that we see, that we would never find this kind of thing. The other thing that cracks me up about this, December 28th, they passed it December 28th. I'm not even sure if the Congress is in session from Thanksgiving to mid-January, quite frankly, these days. So this stuff is just incredible, totally different time. Huge amount of text, but this is a, and I guess I won't read it, I'm suffering a bit of a sore throat, but this came from a document that the House put forward with the bill. So the House wrote this. And the language is quite amazing with regards to um, uh, uh, 
the passion or the underpinnings that they write it in, the prose. So we are our brother's keepers. We are the keepers of the rest of the house. And I will say that I came to the service, and this is my noviceness to the ESA. I came to the service in 2007, five years, a little bit over five years. Basically, the day I walked in the door, um, sitting on my new desk was an NOI for a litigation over the bi-state, over the bi-state um, sage grouse. NOI, notice of intent to sue. So this is a document. Somebody brings to the court and says, you know what, we have a problem with this finding that the service just made over here. And the courts are always our arbitrator. And so I can remember picking up that document, walking to my boss's office, and she was actually just um, about to head out the door to a new, uh, a, a new job. And I said, you know what, um, should I be worried about this? Is this a big deal? And she was like, eh, nah, I wouldn't worry about it. It'll drag on forever. On. And then the roller coaster started. And I've been playing with bi-state grouse and grouse range-wide, or at least in Nevada, ever since, up and down ever since. I will say that I feel privileged to work with the folks that are here that deal with the bi-state. We may have differences of opinion with regards to how we fall on that continuum of this, but I think each and every one that I work with have a passion for the conservation of this species, of this bird. Again, we might want to achieve it in different ways, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't know where you draw the line between conservation and human needs, but we've got to make that decision, and if we do it in a civil way, if we do it in a way that's passionate, that's beautiful stuff. So precursors to the ESA. The ESA has a very unique um, a piece to it, but it obviously um, didn't start it. Wildlife conservation kind of comes from two strands. You have species conservation and habitat conservation. So for years, hundreds, thousands of years, the kings of Europe um, had this uh, principle in mind. Usually it was directed at game species. So we wanted to protect our deers, we wanted to protect our hunting grounds, those kind of things. Even colonial America had places where they set aside because of its importance to game species. Well, the unique piece of the ESA is that it started diverging away from just that interest in game species to grab onto all species, and they considered everything important. And so these are kind of the precursors to that. The Lacey Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, both legislative things that tried to say we're trying to prohibit something from happening on more than just a game species. Following the Migratory Bird Treaty Act came a uh, Migratory Bird Conservation Act, which kind of was the start of the national refuge system. But then truly in the 1960s is when um, uh, uh, congressional legislation started to say that we're more interested, we're interested in more than just game species, we're interested in more than just U.S. species, it started to go international. And so the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act, the Endangered Species Preservation Fund Act, which actually morphed into the Endangered Species Conservation Act once it went international, all were the precursors to the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act uh, is not static. It's far from it, quite frankly. And frankly, from, to the chagrin, I think, of all parties involved, it's, um, uh, it's, it's gone from very prohibitive, and absolutely no, to a very permitted kind of process. So I would say the, um, the environmental conservation side of things would probably uh, not want to see it go this way, and the human resources demand money side of things would probably say it hasn't gone this way, but it has. So 1973, very prohibitive act. Um, an amendment made in 1978 which was um, basically a, um, uh, 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 came out of 
um, a very famous case that most people probably know, uh, but the Tennessee Valley Authority built a dam in Tennessee. Um, so it was TVA versus Hill, and it was over the snail darter. Again, a re very um, well-known kind of thing. Congress um, went in and basically procedurally, legislatively changed the act, but basically they added procedure to it. So they made it more um, burdensome to do stuff. So it made it harder for the service, I would say, to just willy-nilly go forward and do something. They, um, they added a layer of burden. So it made it, um, uh, uh, it added flexibility to the act. I'll say it added flexibility to the act. In 1982, another amendment was added. Um, Congress acted in basically two ways. 1981, James Watt was the Secretary of Interior under Reagan. Um, James Watt added um, a provision administratively as the Secretary of Interior to the Endangered Species Act that basically said, when you're listing a species, we want you to take into account economics. So Congress wasn't real keen on that, and they said, no, we're going to amend the ESA. And so what they did is that's where they inserted a clause of using the best scientific and commercial data available. That's when that was changed. At the same time, they recognized that we were at a bit of a, uh, a loggerheads here. And so they also added discretion to the act. And that discretion came in the form of an incidental take statement. So they added the language in 1982 that basically said, now the service cannot, they don't have to always say no, they can say yes, and here's your statement as long as it's incidental to the purpose of the, uh, uh, what you're doing. So they added discretion on the service side to, um, to uh, uh, um, facilitate that permitting side of the ESA. Instead of prohibitive, it starts to go towards permitting. In the 1990s, um, uh, as you know, things started to heat up in the 1990s in the Congress. I guess they always have. But um, 1994, um, the Republicans uh, move in um, under Gingrich and all that world, hot and heavy, and, um, and uh, basically start to um, find ways of weakening and softening the Endangered Species Act through various bills and various me measures and all that kind of stuff. To compensate for that, Bruce Babbitt, who was the Secretary of Interior under Newt Gingrich or under um, uh, Bill Clinton, um, needed to deal with that. He recognized that there was this, this butting of heads again between conservation of the species, human needs. And so what he did was administratively, he started to insert things that allowed more flexibility into, into the act. And so that's where you start to see the development of these incentive-based strategies like habitat conservation strategy or plans, like um, safe harbor agreements, like candidate conservation agreements with assurances and all these kind of things that allow a more um, uh, perhaps progressive way towards conservation without being just purely the hammer. So really quickly, um, these are uh, uh, kind of a couple of numbers, or at least they flow. Um, in 1967 was basically the first uh, list of endangered species came out. Um, it consisted of 78 species, mostly uh, basically all vertebrates, a mix of mammals, fish, um, uh, a couple of birds, that kind of thing. Um, and um, and then and that so that that stays pretty st steady, quite frankly. This proportion. Of, um, of these vertebrate taxa. But the things that really started to grow were these, um, were the invertebrates, and then as well as vascular plants. So today, the current numbers, um, endangered is E, threatened is T, totals. We break it out into a ton of ways. I just couldn't fit it on the slide. But, um, uh, uh, but of course, this is categorized by um, mammals, fish, all those other things. Um, grand total, 1434 today in the U.S. The service also recognizes under Endangered Species Act listed species in other states or in other countries, but, um, but um, that's not covered here. Um, Delisted, uh, 27 recovered, 10 extinct, and this is since 1973, since the initial um, act establishment. Um, and then 18 other reasons. These are largely taxonomic reasons or issues that uh, we withdrew the petition for errors. So the central requirements of the ESA is basically five sections. Section four is um, the listing part. That's what, that's what when the Secretary of Interior is uh, afforded the responsibility to say what goes on the list and what doesn't. 
Um, Section 7, a uh, ton of people familiar with it, but this is the responsibility of the federal agency. Something funded, carried out, permitted by a federal agency, they have the responsibility or the mandate to make sure what they're doing is not uh, uh, having a negative effect on those, in, uh, those listed species. Section 9 outlines the prohibitions, what you shall not do, the taking, hunt, shoot, shoot at, pursue, kill, all those list of things that you've seen. Section 10 is um, uh, outlines uh, the, the exemptions under Section 9. Basically, this is kind of the private land, and um, uh, but the, um, the exceptions, the exemptions, the, the permits associated with them, um, um, how you can avoid Section 9 violations. And then, of course, Section 7 is the penalties associated with violations. So now um, I'm going to get into section four because I think that's the piece that kind of brings us here today um, and the piece that um, uh, might be redundant for some folks, but, um, but I thought I would just walk through and explain it. One of the interesting pieces of section four is, um, is all this stuff we're talking about today. The service has the ability when we're looking at that ledger of what are the bad things, what are the good things to take that into account, to take into account things that people are doing out on the ground to benefit the species that may offset those negatives that are inherent. <clears throat> so when the service goes through a listing um, determination, a listing decision, um, the Secretary of Interior obviously has the, um, the responsibility to decide whether or not that goes on and off. And they have, we basically use what we call a five-factor analysis. And so these are the five pieces that the Secretary of Interior or me, as I'm passing those things up, um, or my bosses, look at when we're analyzing whether or not this species should fall under the guidance of the Endangered Species Act or whether it should. Factor A, um, basically habitat. You know, these are all the bad things happen to habitat, fire, PJ, advancement, all those kind of things. This is, are we loving them together? <laughs> Is there something about them that we're using up? Are they um, a collectible thing? All that kind of stuff. Disease, predation, um, inadequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms. And then E is always kind of classically that catch-all of um, are there other things we're not paying attention to? <clears throat> Two definitions real quick, threatened and endangered species. Um, basically, um, threatened has a timeline with it. So threatened says, are we going towards extinction in some time horizon. <clears throat> so the listing process, there's essentially three ways that we could get into the listing world. Um, certainly the most common, well, I guess the most common, is the petition. So anybody in the United States can write us a petition. It's got very small requirements. It talks about on a, uh, on a, um, a, a napkin. So it really just has to have your name, it has to have your address, it has to have what you're asking for, and that's really kind of it. Obviously, that's getting more and more savvy all the time, and so petitions get more and more robust. Um, the other way in is uh, uh, agency initiative. Me as a biologist could say, you know what, I have a concern over the species, I think we should go forward. This one is classically, um, doesn't happen a whole lot anymore because it's um, funding driven. If I don't have funding in my office and my boss says, no, you don't have time to work on that regardless of what your opinion is, then I won't work on it. Um, and then the third way is in litigation. Um, obviously, well, not obviously, but basically every decision point that a federal agency makes, the ultimate arbitrator there are the courts. So as soon as the service makes a determination, that's up for um, litigation in the courts. So that's when somebody could step in and say, nope, I don't agree with your opinion. I want to see something else. So, um, so for the petition process, um, there's kind of two steps. The first step is I get, put, I get a petition that lands on my desk. Somebody tells me to work on it. Um, and then I basically have 90 days, it's hard to meet deadlines, but 90 days from the time that petition comes in to say whether or not what's on the four corners, what's within that page is sufficient for a reasonable person to say, yeah, okay, this guy makes sense. This, this, what they're asking for here makes sense. I should be worried. Uh, the bar, the threshold, the, the whatever, the, 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 the threshold for that is quite low. The language is very explicit, quite frankly, in the sense of um, it doesn't take a lot. It takes a reasonable person's opinion to say, yep, you should go on. If that's the case, we begin what's called a status review. 
if that 90-day petition is substantial. We'll go into what's called a status review. This is also called a 12-month finding, um, at which point I can go outside of that box of that petition and gather all the information I could possibly find to ascertain whether or not um, uh, what the decision is going to be on this on, on the status review. So I grab a whole bunch of information from whoever I could get a hold of it. I plug it into our five-factor analysis, which is basically sometimes quantitative, sometimes qualitative, and say, am I concerned? Do any of these five factors have an influence on this species that makes me concerned? At the end of the day, I come up with a finding, or I don't. My bosses do. Um, that uh, basically has, um, uh, can go three different directions. Um, warranted, not warranted, warranted but precluded. We had a little bit of discussion with regards to DPS yesterday. Um, and just as a flow, the service can basically list three things, kind of a fourth, but this one's pretty squishy. Species, a subspecies, a distinct population segment, as well as what we call a significant portion of the range. The SPR piece is not finalized. The game is not done yet. We, we've used it in the past. We've gotten sued over it. Our attorneys haggle over how we interpret it, all those kind of things. So in general, we have those three pieces to list. So as we're going through a finding and somebody makes a determination on, um, say, greater sage grouse, range-wide, we say, no, we think it's not warranted. That's our finding. Then we're required to take that next step and say, OK, are there any little pieces out there that could be considered distinct population segments that, um, that we should analyze? So then we'll do the five-factor analysis again just on that DPS to say whether or not that DPS meets our policy for um, recognition under the Act. So here are the three outcomes, basically, of a 12-month finding. You can go not warranted, you can go warranted but precluded, or you could basically say, this thing is warranted and I'm going to go straight into what we call a proposed rule. And a proposed rule is basically that piece of paper that says, yep, this thing should be recognized under the Act. And that's kind of the point where federal agencies start to recognize it under the Act. They start to say, okay, our policy is such that if something is proposed, then we're going to treat it as a listed species. If you go, as we did in Greater Sage Grouse and the Bi-State DPS, warranted but precluded, the species becomes a candidate. Expeditious progress. In order for us to make a, um, a warranted but precluded finding, we basically have to meet two thresholds. One is that um, there are, in fact, species out there that are des more deserving or more in need of conservation than the one we're playing with. And we're making expeditious progress, meaning that we are dealing with that backlog of candidates in a way that's bringing them either on or off the list so that um, uh, we're not just using this as the eternal parking space, which there's probably been times where, quite frankly, we have. The reason I bring it up is because this was what we got sued over for the MDL. MDL stands for Multiple District Litigation. So we were getting sued by a whole bunch of proponents or a whole bunch of litigants in a bunch of district courts around the country um, over various things, over our candidate backlog. You've got to deal with it. We don't think your finding's right, a variety of reasons. Finally, our lawyers, Department of Justice, said, well, we're going to marry all those together and we're going to deal with this thing. And so in 2011, we reached a settlement um, with a very uh, series of litigants that said, OK, we'll deal with our backlog. And now we have marching orders to deal with our backlog. So basically, by September of 2016, we've got to deal with all our candidate backlog, um, over 250 species. And now we're starting to see marching orders. Some of those were line items. Some of them were actually line items in the stipulated agreement from the court. And Greater Sage Grouse was one of those, where they said, we want you to deal with Greater Sage Grouse by X date. Other of, others of them, the majority, the vast majority, quite frankly, were our listing programs out of our Washington office saying, this is the spreadsheet by how we're going to reach it. And so now they say, here's our appropriation from Congress. Now we're going to go down the path of um, of, uh, of dealing with that, and so here's our triage list. 
So in addition to um, uh, recognizing the species or not recognizing the species, but dealing with the petition and dealing with the listing process um, of whether or not you put a species on the list or not, comes critical habitat. And this is again in section four of the act where it says, not only do you have to take care of the species and recognize that or not, but you also have to give it um, uh, what it needs. So typically the critical habitat process um, has always followed. We make a final listing determination rule. Uh, we wait another year. We get money from Congress. Maybe not. Drags on. Um, and, but somewhere along the line, we're supposed to make a critical habitat. So classically, this has always followed the species determination. Um, but, that, but that's not the case. The other interesting piece about critical habitat is that we do take into economic accounts or effects of economics. So we go through an economic analysis to say, what does the designation of this critical habitat mean to um, that ranch owner or that um, whitewater river guide or whatever the case may be. But um, when species, we don't. We're not looking at the money. We're looking purely at the best scientific um, commercial data available to say whether or not the species should be recognized. We're going through a process of revamping our, um, our listing uh, world, ideally to save money, ideally to make it more efficient, all those kind of things. So from here on out, and all the, other M all the MDLs will be treated this way, we're going to go through the process of how, quite frankly, the statute says we should in the sense of the listing rule on the species comes out with critical habitat all in one. So that's a major difference here. All right, so a little bit of um, how we got here with grouse. So, um, so the service received a handful of petitions over, you know, starting in the late 90s and, um, and moving into the early 2000s. We dealt with those in various ways. Um, we ignored them for a while. We dealt with them for a while. We got sued over them for a while. You know, it's, um, it's uh, um, kind of a classic little circle we live in. Um, basically, uh, the results of all of those um, are kind of captured here. We recognized Columbia Basin as a DPS in, I think, 2002, maybe 2000, kind of forget. Um, we, in 2005, we basically combined the three-range three range wide petitions, and we went not warranted in 2005 over that. Um, the bi-state population, and this was Kevin Kreitz, my predecessor that I, I think a lot of you guys knew, um, uh, basically went non-substantial at the 90-day process, and that was in 2006. So in 2006, and basically that, that not substantial finding was contingent on us not recognizing the DPS. When we go through a DPS analysis, we first say, does it meet our DPS criteria before we go into our five-factor analysis? At this juncture, Kevin said, nope, it does not meet our DPS criteria. So we got challenged on all of that stuff, of course. Um, this one at the top here is basically when I walked in the door in 2007. Um, we got a couple of mixed on our subspecies. Um, basically, uh, uh, um, federal courts out west um, gave it back to us. The ones out east said, you're right. And ultimately, um, the range-wides all came back to us. So we took everything that was outstanding, bi-state, range-wide, Columbia Basin, and in 2010, um, uh, we put all that together. And in 2010, we came out in this, with this finding. We said that range-wide, we thought it warranted protection. But that decision was precluded by a greater need. We said that the bi-state DPS, we recognized it as a DPS, and that it also warranted protection on the Endangered Species Act, but again, was precluded by, um, by higher priorities. Primary threats, habitat modification, destruction, factor A stuff. When you look at species and at-risk species, that's the number one. Habitat, invasive species. Those are number ones, and that affects 95% of those species out there that are at risk. 
Very rarely are there silver bullets. Um, so both of them under the candidate, candidates receive no statutory um, protections under the ESA. There's no um, uh, uh, regulatory burden, I guess I'll say, associated with them. Obviously there's a, um, a lot of rigmarole, in my opinion, good rigmarole surrounding them because I feel like it offers you a moment in time to take a breath and see what you could do to get towards conservation without maybe the, um, the heartburn of, um, of, uh, of prohibitions, I suppose. It's probably not a good way to say it. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm sure there's parts I glossed over. But at any rate, so um, I'll take questions if you have them. My boss is coming up next. So I could defer those questions till he comes up. Now, I guess, Steve, it's possible to be found to be warranted uh, but precluded again, correct? Maybe it's this is the possible, question. It's possible, but absolutely that's not going to happen. There's no way our attorneys would ever sign off on something like that. And quite frankly, it's probably not even possible. I'm sure the settlement agreement says you guys have to give a thumbs up, thumbs down, and there's no in between. I'm sure it's explicit, but quite frankly, I ha I'm not positive about the language. But there's no way it happens, Steve. This question may be for you or, or Ted. Yet you said something that caught my attention earlier in the 90 days, 90 day findings uh, <laughs> is that if there is no funding or your boss tells you that you don't have time to work on this, but you have a petition that landed on your desk, what happens to that species of decision? Does that go in a black hole somewhere? Or? I, I mean, some, I, it's, it's not going away, I assume. So, right. so what, what is the mechanism for that case? Um, and I'm saying this because you, know, you can have a strategy where someone sends you a deluge of petition in one week on purpose to achieve a certain goal, and I'm wondering if that would cause that kind of situation. What would be, I, don't, I don't understand the consequences, so that's why I wanted, I'm asking the question. Yeah, I, I, starting backwards, Louis, um, we do see delusions. I mean, mega petitions are something that had kind of uh, started to come on more and more to where we'd get petitioned for basically every G1, G2 species in Arizona or Hawaii or something to that effect, where it'd be 250 species plus in one petition. And now deal with that. I mean, Nevada itself actually um, has dealt with um, a spring snail petition kind of recently where it was 40, 40 plus, I think 42 species on that petition. Um, it is what it is. I mean, you leave it up to the lawyers, I suppose. We get an appropriation from Congress. They say this is how much money you get. The service splits it into its programs. Listing gets this much, and now we say, okay, who's got the listing workload, um, and what can we afford to pay you? It's not something I really think about personally, quite frankly, but somebody does. I'm sure my boss does. Um, and if we can't deal with it, we, we don't, or we say we don't, and oftentimes that does follow with a, a lawsuit saying, no, you have to. And we say, well, we can't. And they say, no, you have to. Um, and then that goes around for a year or two, and then things start to break loose, and yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, just to try to understand the critical habitat, and just for example, so if there's, um, if white state grouse were listed, and then some subset of the map habitat that we have is identified as critical habitat, <coughs> how would such an application be different within in yeah. yeah, so it's, um, it would come in two pieces. You would consult on both. You would consult on the species, and you would consult on critical habitat. So if you were dealing with the species outside of critical habitat, so it's two determinations from the service. One, are you jeopardizing the species persistence by doing something? You know, is that mine over there going to jeopardize the species persistence, um, the bi-state DPS? Um, two, you would say, is there going to be adverse modification, separate decision, to the critical habitat? So you might have something to where it goes, nope, that's not going to jeopardize the species persistence, but it might jeopardize critical habitat, so you make a determination there. So it's two pieces, two different questions. 
How do you walk back a decision that was made earlier of warranted but precluded to a point where it's not warranted? I mean, where, where we are now <coughs> as an outside observer appears to be, um, you know, with, with one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. And so my question is, how do you reasonably expect to walk back and say, oh, I guess it isn't warranted. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see how the process can produce that type of a result. Well, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to play on your grave thing, Doug. Um, <laughs> well, at the end of the day, it is the long-term conservation. So while I recognize your grave analogy is worried about the proposed or final rule, in my mind, that's just a step. That has nothing, not nothing, but that's a step towards achieving something that, quite frankly, I think we all want. That being said, I recognize your concern over taking those steps. You step back from there, well, I can tell you that my boss or my attorneys would say what has changed from 2010 what has changed and so that's the story if it's there that we'll have to tell in order to step back from that proposed so there's iterations the proposed rule comes um, next September actually August or September of next year um, there will be a whole bunch of people making decisions on it from the spring of 13 right up until the final throws, I'm sure. There may even be slippage, quite frankly. I don't know. I don't know what, what um, folks will do with it. From there, there's another year where we go to the final rule. And that's still another um, uh, iteration or another uh, piece of time to where you try to affect change. The service could still go into a, um, a final rule and said, you know what? And quite frankly, the piece that the biggest piece, and this is um, uh, maybe an unintended pun, the biggest piece in the final rule is peace. Policy for evaluating conservation efforts. We've all talked about this on a number of occasions. The final rule is when we can truly weigh that. The proposed rule has got to be stuff that's truly making a difference since 2010, as far as what my attorneys would say. Since 2010, that's different. In the final rule, we could say, well, we don't have um, a lot of stuff on the ground that we show is making a difference, but we've got this pile of things by state action plan, whatever the case may be, in the wings. We've got this pile of cash over here that we're going to implement with. So we've got a good, good feeling that all of this stuff is going to do the right thing and get done. Other questions for Steve? Yeah, Please. Bob. So if you back that one more step, as, as a warrant, what are you basing that on? If you're looking for a change from 10 forward, uh, who's to say the decision in 10 was correct? You, well, I mean, who's to say? Um, my bosses, the, the Dan Ash, the director, is who's to say, truly. It's his responsibility to make the call or not, or whether or not we recognize something under the... Yeah, so, um, so our listing factors basically uh, range why we went with two. Basically, under that five-factor analysis, habitat modification, destruction, curtailment, um, largely fragmentation of habitat um, uh, loss, and then inadequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms. So factor D. Basically, um, are the things that people have on the books, the other managing agencies have on the books, are they uh, sufficient to affect conservation um, uh, to basically preclude the need for the ESA. We don't need the ESA because what we have over here is already good enough, we're doing fine. So we found those insufficient and we found habitat challenges to be the two listing factors. And the by state, that expanded a little bit. It's still basically the same premise, although I'd argue that or submit at least that um, the, the, the driving 
um, threats contained within factory ASA, pinion, juniper, encroachment, things like that, are slightly different than the range-wide um, uh, issue. We don't have oil and gas leases like Wyoming does. We don't have sod busting like Montana does. Um, we truly don't have the fires that Nevada does, although there's a little bit of pattern to that. Um, by state, we basically went under um, four factors, quite frankly. Um, uh, uh, factor A, habitat fragmentation modification issues. Um, uh, uh, factor C, which is um, uh, disease predation. Um, factor D, which is inadequacy of existing regulatory mechanism. And factor E, which is the catch-all. And truly, it wasn't one um, threat or stressor contained within those factors that we felt were um, uh, uh, challenging the population, but it was that cumulative um, combination of all those things. And as I think we saw quite a lot yesterday, um, all of that, in my mind, is um, contingent on what 150 years has taken us to. You all of a sudden have a relatively small population, a relatively fragmented population, that has been in place that's now sitting there. So now here we are, 150 years of pinion juniper encroachment, or whatever the case may be, lack of disturbance or whatever, that brings us to this point. And now each one of those starts to get tenuous. I mean, you're starting to play with, um, if something blinks out, if the pine nuts blink out, if fails blinks out, if Parker Meadows blinks out due to genetics or due to demographic issues, the probability of it blinking back on is all of a sudden um, uh, uh, hampered. More questions? Well, Steve, thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs>
uh, being completed and underway within the bi-state PMUs. And these projects are focused on providing landscape scale habitat benefits by having the best available science and information drive the project's design and implementation. These treatments have provided benefits to much larger acreages than the simple footprint of any one individual project. Because of these larger landscape, uh, landscape scale ecological issues and their relevance to sage grouse habitat improvement, it's inherent, it's inherent in the design of all pinyon juniper projects underway in the bi-state since the original, original listing decision. Uh, we're also conducting extensive monitoring to ensure the projects are, uh, are achieving their intended goals and there's a me measurable benefit to wildlife, especially sage grouse. In addition to these actions, the NRCS, through the Sage Grouse Initiative, as you just heard all about, um, is uh, providing funding to offer conservation easements to the bi-state landowners who are willing to protect high-value sage grouse habitat on their land while maintaining their working ranches. To date, in fiscal year 2012, NRCS have, has provided $7.8 million in easement funding, matching the $5.9 million in partnership contributions to complete easements on 5,700 acres for the bi-state sage grouse. From a population perspective, the population of the sage grouse within the Nevada portion of the bi-state DPS is stable to increasing. Uh, I think that's pretty significant and great to hear. Um, there's also some extensive work done to fly some lex and fly some lex surveys and we found that there are likely more birds than we thought there were, so that's another significant development. Um, we believe that through the assessment of the condition and status of the bi-state, um, it's, it's threat-based and that the Fish and Wildlife Service should give due consideration to the positive population trend. And it's especially important for consistency in how the service measures its own program success uh, through surrogate species where population objectives will be used to measure its success of programs. Thus, we would expect a similar assessment in the bi-state population where it's stable to increasing. Um, so that's kind of a summary of some of the work that's been done. This is kind of what the governor's office is aware of as far as um, where the, the status of the bird and what we're taking to the Fish and Wildlife Service and what the state intends to um, make our case as for the listing decision specifically. Um, we're bringing that forward and uh, we're keenly aware of that. Um, some of you may have heard also about the Greater uh, Sage Grouse Advisory Committee that we put together and I apologize if um, that was off-putting to any of you that the bi-state wasn't included as part of that, but it really was um, a recognition of all the great work that was already ongoing in the bi-state, a recognition of the different timeline and that we didn't want to insert government um, into that process and get in the way of all the excellent work that you all were already doing here in the bi-state. Um, and so we remain fully supportive of everything that's going on here and intend to do all that we can to ensure that your efforts are reported at the highest levels uh, to the Fish and Wildlife Service such that we can prevent the listing of the, of the, greater, of the bi-state uh, sage-grouse. Um, on the greater front, I'll just take this opportunity to plug that for just a minute. Uh, just on the 25th of October, we received uh, approval for over $300,000 of funding for, uh, to fund the um, establishment of a, a sagebrush ecosystem council and technical team. On that technical team are five people, um, five uh, technical uh, persons from the Department of Agriculture, Department of Wildlife, Division of State Lands, um, and I'm missing Division of State Lands has one, and there's one other one. Oh, Division of Forestry, sorry. <laughs> um, and so that technical team will be dealing with full-time, these are new positions that the state is, um, is putting together right now, um, and we'll be hiring, these folks will deal full-time with sage-grouse issues in the state. And they'll be the um, lead um, individuals to go back to their entity and work together. They'll be housed in Carson City in one office, these five people, so they'll be a, one, a single point of contact for uh, folks to go to and deal with this team. The governor also will be establishing a, sage, a sagebrush ecosystem advisory council, and that council um, will uh, be helping to set policy, uh, broad policy goals for the state and, and, and to manage that process um, specifically related to the greater sage grouse, but over time that may expand to the bi-state if, if that's what's the right thing to do. Um, so we are moving full steam ahead as fast as we can. I know it's, it's slow for some people, but we're moving ahead with that as, as quickly as we can to uh, do the same great work and, and hopefully we'll be in the same position in a couple of years to be able to tell the Fish and Wildlife Service that we've uh, really changed the way that we were going about business, uh, going about our business and that we, um, we believe that we can uh, adequately conserve and protect the species 
uh, in a way that allows for multiple uses in the state and, and doesn't take any lands off of, off of uh, use for agricultural or mining or energy purposes or anything like that while still uh, adequately conserving the species. So that's the greater update. And uh, I don't know if there are any questions. I'd be happy to try and answer a few of them. Questions for Corey? Yes. Sir. plan um, and the recommendations? Sure. For the greater sage grouse, um, sorry to encroach on the, the, the conversation here. The greater sage grouse, uh, the governor established a committee um, in March 30th by executive order, um, the greater sage grouse advisory committee, and they came up with a set of recommendations that many of you attended the numerous meetings. Uh, their uh, state uh, strategic plan that they put forward, uh, the governor received that on July 31st. And we reviewed that. The Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, um, the governor appointed uh, the DCNR uh, as the lead agency for say, greater sage grouse implementation efforts. And they have just finished converting the strategic plan, uh, a draft, finished a draft of converting the strategic plan into an EIS alternative that will be plugged into the BLM um, EIS. So that state alternative is, is being completed. Um, and we will we will roll that out as appropriate if they're if we're working with the federal partners to make sure that we're using the right lingo so that we're the ones translating our plan into what our plan is and they're not the ones that are telling us what they think we said <laughs> and so that, that's a delicate process and we are committed to um, doing that in a public way that if there are significant changes to what the strategic plan said or didn't say um, we will uh, make that call and, and roll it out to the public and maybe have a public meeting if there are significant changes to um, what was in the strategic plan. So that's moving forward as quickly as we can. That's a really big process of combining the 2004 plan with this um, strategic plan, putting that all into a big matrix that adds up so that the BLM can look at them all side by side and say, this is, these are the other alternatives and here's our state alternative. And, and so we want to, we anticipate and hope that, that the state alternative will be the preferred alternative in that EIS. Other questions? Yes. Oh, I'm, thank you for asking, you asked about conservation district. I'm sorry to neglect this. This is something that I'm actually very excited about. Um, part of the approval from the interim finance committee and from the board of examiners um, in the strategic plan, it was recommended that the local working groups be um, coordinated with the state conservation districts. And, um, and so we've received funding um, approval from the state to fund three new conservation district positions to be positioned throughout the state to help coordinate the local area working group, group efforts across the state. And we really see that as a, a recognition of the incredible value that the local area working groups provide to this. I mean, it's really the people on the ground. You folks in here are the ones that make the difference here. Bureaucrats like me, I'm not doing much to save the bird. And uh, I'm, I'm doing all I can, but, um, but you guys are the ones that are on the ground with the birds. And so um, with these conservation district positions, um, they will be engaging the local area working groups in a way that is consistent um, so that we can notice the meetings publicly, so that we can have consistent goals and actions, so that we're working together all across the state in a unified manner um, to implement these actions. So those conservation district positions are going to be really fantastic. I'm excited about that. Um, and I think it's going to be a tremendous improvement. And, and we're really looking forward to being able to engaging the local area working groups from the ground up um, so that information gets fed every way throughout this all. And it's not just some. Um, bureaucrat or someone just making a decision in an office that doesn't know what's going on on the ground. And I have seen sage grouse, by the way. I did go out at 6 a.m. with uh, Dwayne Combs out on his ranch one day and froze my tush off, so it was good. Any other questions? Well, Corey, thank you very much. Yeah, thank really you. I appreciate it, everyone.